come to the end, as it were, of this short series on the cross. We've been using Tom Smale's book, Windows on the Cross, as a rough guide. And uh, we've come to the last theme, topic, and that is the cross and glory. The cross and glory. Perhaps sometimes we do or sometimes we don't associate those two terms together. But the uh, revelation says this, doesn't it? And it does put them together. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. So that's the heavenly choir singing the glory of the Lamb. And you may or may not remember that we've looked at these particular themes, reconciliation, sacrifice, freedom, suffering, justice, victory, participation, and now we're going to be looking at glory. And uh, so we've been looking in depth at this. There are other themes that we could look at. Some theologians outline 20 or 30. I mean, there's plenty of others, but we'll stop now as we go towards the resurrection. But the thing is, the cross speaks to us. The cross is God's word to us, as well as God's word in the word. The God speaks and reveals God to us. It's God's work and it's God's word to us. So if you're here, and, uh, or if you're online listening, over the last nine weeks, God has been speaking to you about the cross. The thing is, as a human being, you need to decide what you're going to do about it. And the statistics at the moment in the UK that say that one in three people, when they've had a conversation with a Christian, or hear a Christian sermon, want to know more. So I hope that's some of you, if you're not yet a Christian, or if online, or watching later, you're not a Christian, then you just be one of those three. I was reminded of Prime Minister David Lloyd George's words in the uh, Houses of Commons. You may not remember this, because it was before most of us were alive. <laughs> but he said this to a fellow MP, the right honourable gentleman has sat on the fence for so long that the iron has entered into his soul. Must have been an iron fence, sharp one, sitting on it. The thing is, you can hear about the cross and Jesus, and unfortunately, the t moments you keep putting it off that you're not going to commit yourself to this man of God, to this man on the cross, y your heart gets hardened. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Don't keep putting it off if God is speaking to you. If you suddenly, for the first time in your life, you suddenly realize what the cross was all about, until I was about 20, I'd heard of the cross, but I had no idea what it was about. I went to a school associated with the cathedral. I heard the Bible, King James, read every morning for seven years. Nothing, nothing hit me, nothing at all. Don't be in that kind of position. Now, the glory of God shines through all those themes that we just looked at. Redemption, propitiation, our taking our place in the cross, carrying the cross. But... We've got to be very careful. It's not an earthly human glory. You're going to see the glory of a king in a few weeks, aren't you? They're already setting aside the anointing oil in Jerusalem. They're already preparing a special floor that you can only walk on in your socks. We're going to see the glory of kings like the British Isles can, probably in the whole world, does better than most. We're going to see the glory of kings, but that's not the glory of this king. This king is a glorious man on a shameful cross, to quote Tom Smale. The glory of God in Jesus Christ and his cross is the shame of a shameful death of a criminal, willingly accepted on our behalf. So, let me, we'll return to this in a bit, but let me just read you a few verses from John 12, because we'll look at, in the second half of this sermon, we'll look at John's particular theology of the cross, and you'll see it's just completely countercultural to how we think. Let me just read you a few verses from John 12. Now, <clears throat> there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. 
But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So this is a trigger point for Jesus. The, the Gentiles are coming from the west. In the past, the wise men came from the east, but now the Gentiles are coming from the west to Jesus, coming to the Messiah. And Jesus knows, yeah, this is the moment. All history is being fulfilled. And he says, my hour, you can see him thinking, yeah, it's time for glory. Time for glory. Time for my glory. And all he sees is a cross. And all he feels are nails. And all he feels is a spear. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Because his glory is the moment of his death. So we're going to look at two points. Firstly, we'll just look at the glory of God, how we usually think of it, how we think of the glory of God, and then we'll look at the glory of God in the cross, which is, I say to you, a countercultural, shocking way of thinking that should change our minds, really, about how to live and die. Just a hint of where I'm going. Have you heard of George Whitfield? Probably the greatest British evangelist, led the way for the Wesley brothers into open-air preaching preached and saw revival in England and Wales and Scotland and America, crossed the Atlantic numerous times in those old ships in the 18th century, going through storms and everything, being mocked, persecuted, having rocks and all sorts thrown at him, dead cats at one time, blood. And he said, when they asked him, what do you want on your gravestone, George? He said, just put this, here lies GW, the great day will reveal what manner of man he was. Do you want that on your tombstone? Here lies RGB. The great day will reveal what manner of man he was. That's, that's all that matters, what God thinks. And I'll pepper during this talk a few examples like that. Let me tell you about Angie. Angie was or is, I don't know if she's still alive, farmer's wife in Cornwall, used to come to my church when she could, because sometimes her husband used to drain the petrol off her car, so she couldn't come. He used to keep her home a bit like a domestic slave. Her hands sometimes were just completely lacerated from preparing chickens and turkeys. And he used to mock her because she'd be reading her Bible, and she'd say to her, you've read that once, haven't you? Well, just get rid of it now. You've read it once. You only need to read it once. See, she's known in heaven Jesus knows her. She, in earthly terms, is nobody. God knows who she is. God has not forgotten her. Glory on this earth and glory in heaven, two different things. Okay. <laughs> so, the glory of God as we usually think of it. I just picked out four ways in which we normally think of the glory of God. We often think of it in terms of creation. We often think of it in terms of redemption. We think of it and we see it in the transfiguration. And we definitely see it when we learn about the second coming of Jesus. So in creation, you'll, you'll know these words, won't you? Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. Did you see the planets a couple of weeks ago? Jupiter and Venus hanging under a crescent moon. You could see them. Massive planets. The glory of God. I used to look into the skies and into the sunset when I, before I was a Christian, thinking, there must be something there. It's not all an accident. What is it, though? Where is it? Who is it? The glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. There was a change of regime. A king died in... Uh, Judah, but Isaiah the prophet had a vision that the real king hadn't died, the only king that really matters. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, literally burning burners, burning angels, burning supernatural beings. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. So Isaiah the prophet saying, Yeah, there's a change of regime. Will Assyria come? What will happen? Who's on the throne? And God says, I'm on the throne. And John 12 says that Isaiah actually saw Jesus' glory. 
in redemption. So we see God's glory in creation, we see God's glory in redemption. Forecast, for example, in Isaiah 40, if you remember our series through that recently. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, says your God. That's how Isaiah 40 starts, if you remember. <coughs> Excuse me. The voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And, and what? And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So for Isaiah, he's saying redemption, glory is coming because you're going to come back from exile, back from Babylon. But we know, this was used in the Gospels, isn't it? This is John the Baptist, a voice of one calling, "Ill the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. John the Baptist says, this is me. And what he's saying is, I'm preparing the way for a glorious Messiah. Unfortunately for John, Jesus wasn't the kind of Messiah he expected. He was puzzled. What's all this healing and compassion and, you know, get on with judgment? Are you the one that we are to expect or are you another? But the glory of the Lord, you see, John the Baptist couldn't quite see that. The glory of the Lord was that he was going to die. That's the issue. Confused John the Baptist. Right, you're all sleep deprived. I just want to check you're awake. <laughs> <Not in here. laughs> okay, who's awake? What's in, what are three, uh, these three guys here? <laughs> Can you think of anything in common about them? Richard the Lionheart, Henry V, Strider, Aragorn, son of Arathorn, the king. Anybody know? Can anybody think what, what might connect those three characters? You may or may not know. <laughs> At least I can see the little grey souls. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, that Lord of the Rings is the last one. That's Strider and Aragorn. That's not. Well, there is a theme of the coming of the king in the Lord of the Rings, isn't there? Yeah? That's one thing. Uh, some, the, the first two, no, I mean the first and the third, not so much Henry V. I'll put you out here, Ms. Perhaps it's a little bit too obscure. So if you've seen Disney, the, the historical work Robin Hood by Disney, because Robin Hood is a fox, according to that, <laughs> but Richard the Lionheart's a bear. Do you remember that? Well, when Richard the Lionheart went on the Crusades, he was uh, on his way back, and he got kidnapped by the Duke of Austria, and he was held for ransom. And then when he got released, he came back to England in disguise as an ordinary man, as a beggar man. And then revealed himself, if you follow the myths, to Robin Hood, the, the fox, him. Henry V, if you've done your Shakespeare at school, Henry V, he led the English troops in battle at Agincourt, where the Welsh archers actually won the battle. But Henry V, the night before the battle, went down among his troops in disguise as a soldier. Disguise, that's in the Bible as well, actually. There's a king who does that. But he, uh, he goes among the troops to find out what the morale is like. And in the Lord of the Rings, Strider, Aragorn, son of Arathorn, he is the king. But he, in the first books and most of the film, he's in a cloak and he's just a, a strange, wandering uh, sort of ex soldier. Nobody knows quite who he is until suddenly the cloak's off and there's the king. And uh, that's the thing that I've linked between those. There's a king there, but nobody knows he's a king when he's in disguise. But the king will come. So, this is, leads me into the transfiguration. And here we have our king. Most of the time, he's got a cloak, a big heavy cloak round him. And his glory is hidden. But when they nailed this man to the cross, when they shoved above his na name, uh, he's had the king of the Jews, they've got that right actually. This is the Lord of glory that they crucified. Remember the transfiguration? <clears throat> after about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. 
Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, that in literally his exodus, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. If the powers of this world had known who Jesus was, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, says Paul, doesn't he? Just for a moment, on the Mount of Transfiguration, it blazes out who he really is. I don't know if you've ever been hit by lightning or nearly been hit by lightning. I've been in the Alps in an electric storm and lightning has been flashing all around me, hitting the rocks. You could feel it, I could feel the heat. And I thought, I'm going to get blinded in a moment because these lightning bolts were coming at us. And it says here, this, his clothes, it says, became as bright as a flash of lightning. That is who Jesus is. <clears throat> Can you move it on for me, please? Okay. And Peter later on, there's an old man in his second letter. Peter says this as he uh, meditates back upon that transfiguration moment. He says, for we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. So, Peter's thinking back, yeah, this is the one I betrayed as well. He even knew who he was, but he still betrayed him. So let me tell you about a little story. I said I'd pepper some stories in about the kind of glory I'm talking about. Who's heard of Hudson Taylor, a major missionary to the China, to China, yeah? Most people have, yeah? When I was teaching the youth for many years, I used to say to them, you know about Billy Graham? And they'd say, no. <laughs> We've never heard of him. So you, you can't assume anything. Have you heard of this guy, though? Dixon Host. He was the successor to Hudson Taylor. He led the China Inland Mission for 40 years. He had a major headache of organization and restructuring. He led them through the Boxer Rebellion, that terrible, violent time. But nobody remembers him anymore, do they? But he's there, and he's with Jesus in glory. Here lies D.H. The great day will reveal what manner of man he was. The second coming, the fourth thing, we've looked at the glory of God in creation, redemption, the transfiguration, the second coming. The second coming is full of glory. Mark 13. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. He's coming back, he's coming in glory. It's going to be completely glorious, like lightning flashing from the east to the west, he said. And James and John get in on this, because Jesus is talking to them about, he's coming back in glory, and they think, we need to get in on this. And the, their mother, actually, in another gospel says, I want you to do this for James and John. They think, glory's coming, we want some glory, let's get a word in now. Okay, that's the way of thinking about earthly glory, isn't it? James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus, they said this, Teacher, they said, we want to do for you whatever we ask. That's a really stupid prayer, actually, I would never pray that if I was you. Teacher, they said, we want to do for you whatever we ask. Jesus says, oh, you're thinking, oh, what's coming here now? What do you want me to do for you, he asked. He knows, he knows what they want. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? That's code. Can you suffer like I suffer? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. 
Herod killed James, didn't he? And the Romans put John on Patmos. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they had been prepared. The other ten disciples, apostles, they hear about this. They think, James and John, they're giving in their CVs behind our back. It's not good. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that will lead us into the second point. But the point is this. Jesus is saying glory, servanthood, leadership, kingship. It's all, I'm just destroying all your ideas about it. This is countercultural. This is a counter-culture. Any, some of you maybe come from cultures where it's beneath your caste, let's say, to clean the floors. Or you may have two or three degrees, and so you think it's beneath you to teach the toddlers. Or you come from a posh area of Nottingham, so you don't think you should do any of the menial tasks. Or you think because you're a leader, you ought to wear special clothing, and people ought to address you in a funny sort of way. And I want to say to you, all of those things, whether your culture is black, white, whatever, Wherever you're from, your culture has got to come in line with what Jesus says. And he says this, Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Remember, he washed the feet of the disciples. And that was the, the lowest of the slaves' job. Preferably not a Jewish slave. Preferably a Gentile slave to do that job. And he says, I've set you an example you want to be a leader, you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you just do this. <laughs> you wash the feet, you clean the block loose. You do that. Because we're talking about a different kind of glory. The glory of God in the cross, and that becomes our definition of glory. And I looked at John there, and John wrote his gospel later, and he must have been thinking, Jesus, when he said that, he just got me. I was thinking this, but he said, no, if you want to be great, you be the servant. And John's gospel in particular has got a very distinct view of glory. St. Augustine says this in his homilies on John about Jesus. He was first humbled by his passion, for we would not have risen from the dead if he had not died. Humility merits glory. Glory rewards humility. Humility merits glory. Glory rewards humility. So let's look at some of the verses uh, in John. And we'll start with ones that are nearer to our kind of idea of glory, and then we'll get into the ones that are considerably removed from an earthly kind of glory. How it starts, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling. Literally, tabernacle, pitched His tent among us, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, so I've been reading, in a believing kind of way, the Gospel of John for over 50 years now, and I've read the first big commentaries I read were on John, and I wanted to say to you that I still don't get it. Okay? I still don't get it. The Gospel of John is so simple on one level, but then you go in deeper and you think, I'm completely out of my depth. I have no idea really what this is about. But the Word through whom the universe and the galaxies were made became flesh and took a body like ours that can get psoriasis and, and get bleeding and can feel pain. The eternal Word took flesh and made his dwelling. He tabernacled among us. And the, John's referring there to the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, that was filled with glory in the wilderness, so Moses himself couldn't go into it. And he's saying Jesus' flesh was so filled with that glory that if it really was revealed, like it was on the Mount of Transfiguration, you would not be able to stand before it. And so there's a paradox for a start. Glory 
we've seen his glory, but it's glory in flesh. Human, frail flesh, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail, the incarnate deity. And then John talks about miracles, but he calls them signs, doesn't he, in his gospel. And just give you two that show Jesus' glory. Changing the water into wine at the wedding of Cana of Galilee. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. He just gave them a, an idea who he was. A friend of mine's got loads of PhDs and stuff in physics and he sat down and worked out that the power involved in changing the molecules of water to wine is like nuclear bombs going off. I don't know if that's true or not. I didn't, I, I didn't do physics much. Lazarus. Lazarus was his friend. If you don't know the Bible, Lazarus was Jesus' friend. He died. They said, come and heal him. And Jesus said, no, we'll wait three days till he's dead. Uh, and he said, what? And when, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. What do you mean? It's about you, is it? Yeah, it's about me. Oh, right, okay. This is for God's glory. So then let me come, finally, <laughs> as I race the clock, to three countercultural texts. And they all start with the idea of death. The hour has come. Now is the time. The death of the Son of God is approaching. And Jesus says, through this, Father and Son, we will both be glorified. I've read you that bit, so I'll skip that bit. And so, in the same context of John 12, the Greeks have come, Jesus knows this is right. Okay, we're coming to the end now. The hour has come. He'd said before to his mother and others, the hour has not come, my hour has not yet come. And now he says, the hour has come. Now, this is John's version of Gethsemane. Now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. So again, you see, the time of trouble, Jesus overwhelmed with the thought of suffering, and glory starts to come in. And a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. That's the devil. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. So there you have it. It's such a, the voice of God. Jesus is saying the cross is coming, and God says, yes, I have glorified my name and will glorify it again. So what we learn from that as we sort of grasp, try to grasp what does this mean, it means that somehow or other in the whole passion, in the whole sending of Jesus, in his life, his death, his resurrection, his exaltation, his coming, God's glory is caught up in that. I have glorified it, says God the Father, and I will glorify it again. Moving on, another second instance of this, chapter 13. This is the chapter 13 to 17 in John is the upper room, talks and the washing of the feet, and the Last Supper. Jesus is telling them about the Holy Spirit, Jesus praying. And he says, I'm going to give a piece of bread to the one who's going to betray me. Just watch. And Jesus does that. And as soon as Judas, that's Judas Iscariot, had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. And that always means something, doesn't it? Light, night, night outside, darkness in Judas's heart. And when he was gone, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and we glorify him at once, which needs quite a lot of thinking. What does that mean? But, just briefly, Jesus is betrayed, and he says, now the Son of Man is glorified. You think, you are. You are. Now the Son is man is glorified because it's all coming together now. They're going to come, they're going to arrest me, they're going to nail me to a cross. And God is going to be glorified in that. And if God is glorified in Jesus, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. And again, today, I have no idea really fully what that means, totally. 
But I know what it means is he's going to be glorified in the cross. He's going to be glorified in the events all around that and the resurrection and the exaltation. And he will glorify him at once. What does that mean? I'm not quite sure. It might mean something as we get a clue in the chapter 17 when Jesus prays. Just before he goes out to be betrayed, Jesus prays. you remember John 17? I remember reading that for the first time thinking, wow, I'm overhearing a prayer of the Son of God to the Father God. After Jesus has said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed. Let me just uh, read. I don't like reading from there all the time. <clears throat> After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. There it is again. The hour has come. Now is the time. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Whoa! So, glory, the cross, it all comes together. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. This is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So I say to you again, I don't want to finish this series on the cross without saying to you, do you know that? This is life eternal, to know Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You can know him today. You don't have to do anything, actually. You just come and say, I want to know you. I've heard of you. I want to really know if you're alive. Come into my life. Make yourself real to me. Whatever you want to say, he'll listen. This is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And then he's saying, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. So don't just say Jesus was a good teacher. Don't, don't, don't. That's just stupid, isn't it? This is a man, if you like, saying, I existed before the universe in the glory of God. And you try to say he's just a good teacher. Uh, give me and give him a break. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. So I'm finishing. You only got a moment. Doxa, Kabo, Greek, Hebrew, glory, they both have the idea of weight, the weight of glory. C.S. Lewis has written a whole little sermon about that. I might share that with you later. It's worth reading. But the real weight of glory is this, that the weight of the sin of the world was on Jesus on the shameful cross. The weight of glory because he took the weight of the sin of the world. And that, my friends, is where God's glory blazes most brightly. Not in the northern lights that you may have seen in the last few days. Not in the sunset. Not in the glory of creation. But the glory of God in the cross. Grace, love, holy love. And the glory of God, whenever it appears in the Bible, it impacts man, it stuns man, it makes them silent, they don't know what to do. And they get their thoughts changed. So I'm just saying to you, if you've been listening to this, I, I just uh, put to you, you might want to revise your thought of what glory is. You might decide to serve him, even if nobody notices. Remember I'd said I'd pepper a few thoughts in 1979. I heard a talk at a conference about James Haldane of Morocco, missionary to Morocco. He served there for 40 years as a pioneer missionary. Guess how many people he saw converted? None. None. Live to glorify him. I know James Haldane's name. I've not forgotten his name. God is not for it. He's in the presence. He's in the glory. He did what he was called to do. Live to glorify him. And I'll finish with this. Anticipate glory. If you know Jesus, glory is yours. You're going to glory. Your loved ones are in glory. Father, this is the last words of this prayer nearly. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. So do you know that Son of God? Do you know that glory? Have you tasted little glimpses of that? The streams on earth you've tasted, more deep you will drink above. 
In this life we get glimpses, but then the fullness. The glory of God in the cross of Jesus. Amen. I've seen you